evening. My name is Jennifer Van Ness, and on behalf of the Board of Student Advisors and Dean Clark, I welcome you to the final round of the 87th Annual Ames Moot Court Competition. Tonight, the United States Supreme Court will hear arguments in Ride Along Productions and Ames Broadcasting Company versus Susanna Michelle Rogers. The case presents a First Amendment challenge to California's recently enacted Invasion of Privacy statute. The record was written by the Ames Fellow, Martina Stewart. Representing the petitioner is the Archibald Cox Honorary Team, composed of Alvin Bragg, Daniel Gordon, Sarah Harrington, and Adam Zubin. Oralists for the petitioner are Arlo Devlin Brown and Aaron Murphy. Representing the respondent is the Telford Taylor Memorial Team, composed of Mick Jurgens, Peter Nicholas, Stuart Sponkin, and Kamitra Thompson. Oralists for the respondent are Grant Dixon and Maya Cobersi. Presiding as Chief Justice is the Honorable Stephen G. Breyer of the United States Supreme Court. Joining him are the Honorable Lawrence H. Silverman of the United States Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit and the Honorable Diane P. Wood of the United States Court of Appeals for the Seventh Circuit. Please hold your applause until all oralists finish, remembering that the petitioner has time for rebuttal. Please also refrain from flash photography during the argument. The judges will pose behind the bench for photos a few moments before the argument begins. Best of luck to both teams and enjoy the argument. Stand up. For pic you want pictures now? Yes. Yeah. Stand up again? Yeah. You stay down. No, no, you all stay down. <laughs> We don't do this in our courts. <laughs> All right, okay. we're now, now serious. Uh, we're going to hear the case of the Ride Along Productions uh, versus Suzanne Rogers and Michelle Rogers, if you'd like to begin, counsel. Mr. Devlin Brown, what language in 1708.8 .8 itself are you focusing on uh, that indicates to your mind that this singles out the press? Um, Justice Wood, there is no language in 1708.8 .8 which says specifically that the law focuses on the press. Nonetheless, this court in the First Amendment area has consistently held firm that a state cannot, quote, the NAACP, cannot foreclose the exercise of constitutional 
who writes by their labels. That's been repeated in Sullivan, and it's been repeated in this case in Falwell. So although this is clothed in the laws of general applicability, it's clothed as a common law intrusion tort. In fact, in every way that Section 1708.8 differs from California's common law intrusion tort, it narrows it so that it focuses on intrusions committed by the press. But suppose somebody um, had been hired to conduct industrial espionage for a private company and, and was planning on selling images captured through this very sophisticated technology. This law would apply to that kind of a transaction, would it not? It may apply to that transaction. It would depend, of course, if the person who was conducting the, the espionage could justify it in terms of they're looking for something that was um, illegal or somehow violated even public health or safety. But what if they didn't? What if they just uh, were trying to, let's say, spy on the president of a company and they were trying to compromise that individual, trying to catch that person in a personal or familial activity as opposed to some of the exceptions that the statute outlines? Certainly that person then would be liable under 1708.8. And our argument tonight is not that there's a perfect fit in the one-on-one -on -one correlation between who 1708.8 applies to and who is the press. Nonetheless, we feel that the, the way that this law has been narrowed from the common law court of intrusion, rather than applying to all intrusions, but limiting it to microphones and cameras, enhancing devices, and more importantly, limiting it to ca the capture of images and sounds from that is a way of narrowing this work so it focuses on the press. Because the capture requirement, Justice Wood, cannot really be justified in terms of any sort of protection of privacy. The intrusion toward has always been about how people obtain the information, not whether it's published after. And the intrusiveness of someone who uses high-powered binoculars, whether to conduct corporate espionage, whether they're keeping calm, whether whatever the circumstances, is equal to intrusion committed by the same person who then snaps the photo and plans to maybe disseminate the photo, and that person would be liable under Section 1708.8. I'm not sure I understand that argument, uh, Counsel. It would seem to me that the recording of the visual or audio images makes it a much greater invasion of privacy because the possibility then appears that it can be distributed to hundreds of people. Whereas if I just, as you put it in your brief, I'm just a single peeping Tom with binoculars, uh, that isn't as much of an invasion of privacy as if I'm recording that because once I record it, it could be a million people that see it. Wasn't that a logical line for the legislature to draw? Justice Silverman, certainly um, the intrusion where you capture the information, if it could lead to dissemination, that is a way in which it could be more intrusive. But it's only more intrusive in that it could lead to the dissemination of this information. And when a legislature's aim is to target dissemination, and not just any dissemination here, but dissemination on the basis of the content of those pictures, since 1708 minute only applies in limited circumstances, then even assuming that that's a constitutionally permissible motive um, for the California legislature to focus on the dissemination of information, the statute still is neither- Counsel, it seems to me you're going off on a different point. Maybe I'm, perhaps I'm misunderstanding. Uh, but I thought your argument was this was aimed at the press so clearly because of the capture aspect of the legislation. Uh, and I, as I said, I didn't understand that because it seemed to me that the legislature was concerned only about the invasion of privacy. It made certain, it made a good deal of sense to uh, ban the capture rather than just the peeping because it implied a much greater invasion of privacy. Isn't that true? Certainly the dissemination of information. No, 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 just the capture. Forget the dissemination for a moment. The capture makes the dissemination possible to a much wider audience, right? right? So wasn't it logical for the legislature to draw that line if their only concern was privacy? We actually don't think it would be, Justice Silverman, because if the legislature was worried about capture and information getting out so the privacy wouldn't be invaded more, then the line they should have drawn would be around the dissemination of information. The capture requirements both over and under are conclusive in terms of protecting against the dissemination of information. For example, a paparazzo who follows Madonna for a week may invade her privacy hundreds of times as a classic intrusion, yet disseminate an image only once. So by focusing on, on the capture requirement as a proxy for the, the information getting out to the general public, you're not punishing the right thing. Moreover, the dissemination of information can occur 
by people who are not involved in the initial capture at all. So in that way, it's both over and under inclusive to be focusing on capture as a means of disinformation leading to the press. Moreover, the common law tort of intrusion draws no such distinction between capture and reporting, nor does California's wiretapping statute or eavesdropping statute. So the focus on capture in this case, combined with evidence in the legislative history, shows that it was intended to single out the press. Well, so what? I mean, suppose they say, yes, of course, that's true. It's the press that's doing it. It's the press that's going invading people's privacy, taking pictures of them in their bedroom, uh, uh, going into the most private things and selling it to five million Americans. Uh, obviously, it's aimed at the press. So? Justice, Chief Justice Breyer, we do not think that um, we would handicap California to protect against invasions of privacy. The argument, though, is that they could do this through laws that don't single out the press. They could have boosted the damages for the common law court no, no, what they're mostly worried about is people who use long distance cameras and uh, microphones to go take pictures of people in their bedrooms, behind closed doors, capturing their most intimate conversations uh, on the pillow of their bed, uh, unaware, and then distribute it to 50 million Americans. That's what they're worried about. Now, what's wrong with the legislature saying that's a serious problem we think it's wrong for people to do this, and therefore we pass a law against it. Perhaps not the perfect law, but uh, a law that's uh, roughly aimed at that kind of thing. What's wrong with that? Where in the Constitution does it forbid that? We would say that it's forbidden under this court's decisions in Minneapolis Star, even as the Commissioner of Revenue. Although that was just a tax on the press. Those cases, Chief Justice Breyer, did simply involve taxes. All right, so uh, then what's on the other side of that is raising money. You can raise money in a million ways. I guess what's on the other side of this is the most intimate, private area of a human being's life. Now, uh, I, I don't, why, why uh, do tax cases require us uh, to uh, strike down this? Well, the tax cases for discriminatory taxes against the press have been cited by this court for the broader principle that the press should not be singled out for differential treatment. Well, why can't you single them out for differential treatment if they're the ones who are doing it? They are the ones who are intruding on a person's private life. If you can protect that with the generally applicable law, which we contend you can, the problem with focusing specifically on the conduct when it takes mm -hmm. place by the press is that when the press is, is subject to a special law, then even if that law doesn't pose an intolerable burden on the press, there's the risk of self-censorship. But that's, that was, I think, the essence of the court's holding in Minneapolis Star when it said it's the threat of sanctions that may deter the exercise mm -hmm. of the First Amendment rights when the press is singled out more than the fact that any particular sanctions would apply themselves. The tax in that case, for example, did not even particularly pose... And so in your opinion, this statute would be constitutional if it said no one uh, can make recordings of people's private lives through the window, etc., and publish them uh, to more than uh, uh, five people. If we added that, then it would be constitutional in your view. I think two things would have to be added to the statute to mm -hmm. make it constitutional. Yeah. First, um, the exemption that private entities such as private investigators would enjoy would have to be closed off. The other thing that would have to be changed about the statute, I believe, Chief Justice Breyer, is the emphasis on publication. This court in Cox um, broadcast, Cox v. Cohen, and in Florida Star v. DJF has emphasized that this, the Supreme Court has not decided whether it's ever legitimate for a state to block the publication of, of information. And Cox v. Cohen involved uh, a private fax play, where that would be the one situation maybe where private information could be blocked. This situation reveals, this, this law covers much more than private facts. In fact, there were no private facts revealed in this case, and the information was newsworthy. Well, well wait a minute. I mean, there, there's a provision of this law that says that the sale, transmission, publication, and so forth shall not itself constitute a violation. So it's looking back at the collection phase. Uh, so I, I think that you're reading more into the language. I'm not sure this law reads so differently from the, the law that Justice Breyer uh, has just described. Um, it may be that most of the time, as you're arguing, the press will be the one that violates it. You've already agreed that it won't all the time be the press. Uh, so there's, there's some overlap, um, but whoever in a sense, trespasses, the analogy is to common law, trespass, uh, should be liable. Um, the problem, though, is that although it said, the statute certainly says that publication should not in itself result in liability, it does 
does contain a disgorgement provision, which is tailored to when the information is captured for commercial purposes. But then commercial purposes is subsequently narrowed in the statute to refer only when information is sold, broadcast, or transmitted. That is going to inevitably affect the press because the press can't do much with this information unless it is sold, broadcast, or transmitted. As opposed to, for example, the industrial spy who makes, who is paid to go acquire the material but doesn't charge anything for these photographs that result. Who, who doesn't sell it to the client who, who hired him? The transaction we think could be structured in a way so the client's not buying the photographs. The client is buying the investigative services. The press, on the other hand, are going to have to broadcast or transmit this image if anything is going to be done. The other problem with the statute, though, and the reason it's not a law of general applicability, is it provides a sweeping exemption for entities such as private investigators as long as they can give some justification, some suspicion that they're looking to obtain evidence of not just crime, but anything that's illegal, any kinds of insurance violation, anything that violates uh, business practices that violate public health and safety. Um, this court before, as in the city of Badu v. Galeo, has looked to the exemptions of what might otherwise be an adequate and constitutional law to reveal its unconstitutional purpose. Why and would the press not be under the language of subpart F, though, since it's another entity, either public or private, and if there was an articulable suspicion that something illegal or fraudulent, et cetera, were happening, why are you assuming the press doesn't get the benefit of that? Um, certainly some press might get the benefit of 1708.8 Act if they can say that in the course of their employment they're seeking to obtain evidence of illegal activity. However, under this court's holding in Arkansas Writers Project v. Ragland, discriminations amongst the press on the basis of their content um, is also unconstitutional. That case dealt with a tax on magazines that gave um, a tax break to some magazines but not others on the basis of their content. Counsel, I have one question I'd like to ask you procedurally. Uh, which, is it you or your co-counsel that is going to deal with this question of malice? Uh, that would be my co-counsel, Justice All right. Thank you. Forgive me if I start with one question at the outset to, to steer away some underbrush that confuses me. You make this alternative argument that we should get into the question of whether a malice requirement should be applied not just to this statute but to the to general tort. Isn't that correct? And, I'm, and you suggest that you may not have acted maliciously. Indeed, you may not have even violated the law. What I'm utterly mystified about is why you're suggesting that to us in this brief when uh, the question comes up to us on summary judgment. I mean, you're suggesting do you may, even no matter what we say, you may not have violated this law. Why are you bringing that to the Supreme Court? That would be a question to be decided at trial, right? Not on summary judgment. Justice Silverman, this court has before entertained reviews of summary judgment opinions regarding whether or not malice existed to uh, support the finding of malice. And that no, but I'm going to the question in your brief in which you suggest that you may not have actually violated the law because you may have had the articulable suspicion that there was a crime going on. Well, that can't be a ma matter that you're properly bringing before us now, is it? Can it? Do you want us to try this case now? Certainly not, Justice Silverman. But definitely this court should decide whether the statute imposes liability at too low a threshold, as we feel the negative standard, evidenced by precedent and by this court's previous treatment of privacy laws. But on summary judgment, we have to assume that the plaintiff's pleadings are correct, don't we? We can't go at, uh, under the question of whether, well, did you really in fact violate the law or not? That's not appropriately before us, isn't it? You really withdraw that, don't you? <laughs>
context, this court has indicated that it is the, the province of this court to independently review the facts on uh, the records to determine whether or not- We don't have any record. You raise the question of whether or not you actually violated the law or not, whether you were, when you were recording, you thought there was a crime in progress. Uh, now, we can't possibly get into that, can we? Then this case shouldn't be here. We, you think we granted certiorari improvidently? Is that what you're suggesting? <laughs> Were you negligent? Um, perhaps we were negligent, Justice Sullivan, although... Well, wait a minute. You were saying in the brief that you didn't violate the law at all. So if you, were, if you didn't violate the law, you weren't even negligent, right? We were not arguing that in the briefs that we necessarily weren't liable underneath the law. More to the point that... You weren't necessarily liable or not liable. We were sort of just to assume the facts. I, I, I'm utterly mystified by that. We feel as though it's, it's highly likely that given the circumstances under which Ryder Long filmed this material, they did not realize, certainly under a malice standard, that they were invading the privacy in an offensive manner. For instance, the LAPD, the very organ of the state, authorized this conduct. It signed a contract with Ryder Long, agreeing to let us come along, film the material. So certainly- Why does the LAPD speak for the privacy of the Rogers? Certainly they don't speak for the privacy of the Rogers. But in terms of measuring the offensiveness under a reasonable person standard, the, the, the views of the state's own uh, or the, the municipality's own uh, officers seems to somehow come into the quantum. In You're saying that you think the police are the people you would ask about whether somebody who's about to be searched or whose house is about to be invaded uh, will regard it as offensive or not? Certainly not specifically just the police, <laughs> but it is one of the factors in uh, this court has, or excuse me, the California courts have recognized in determining whether something was offensive is to consider the, the uh, community standards, the degree, the context of the invasion, things that the association with the police might indicate. Well, and the community standards here are whether you expect inside your house to have, in effect, um, the television cameras rolling while you sit there and weep. Uh, I'm not sure that that's what people think. They probably think once they're inside, they're in some private region. Justice, what that raises, I think, exactly one of the major problems with the statute, which is that if you're sitting inside your house weeping, and uh, committing a crime as you do it, then you can be filmed. You can be filmed. The, uh, the bedtime, the pillow talk that Justice Breyer referred to earlier can permissibly be filmed if you're uh, fraudulently inducing someone to do something as you talk this about it. Maybe it can, but uh, this is a matter of what California has chosen to do. And as others have pointed out, uh, here the legislature apparently feels it's much worse to intrude into the bedroom and to broadcast that to 50 million people than it is just to intrude into the bedroom. Well, isn't that judgment a reasonable one? And why doesn't that make it constitutional? Justice Breyer, it might be reasonable to draw distinctions in a manner that doesn't distinguish between contents of material that may be collected. California has said in this statute that if you are collecting material about things that are illegal or adverse to the public health and safety, for instance, a mechanic sleeping on the job or your daycare mm -hmm. not hiring its workers without a with a full interview. You can film, you can invade the privacy of those You know, I, I understand that kind of argument. What I'm really looking for is, is that you argue throughout in your brief that the legislature has to show some special justification, some compelling need to restrict the press. And I'm asking you why. That is, in all the cases you cite, on the other side of the equation is some kind of general important interest <laughs> Here, the other side is privacy itself. So what standard are we supposed to use where we have two important constitutional interests, one opposed to the other? Are you saying that the First Amendment is more important than the right to privacy? And if they're the same, what standard do we use? Justice Breyer, I think the First Amendment at least is on the same terms. Fine. Once we say it's on the same terms, then what is the relevance of all those cases you cite? Why should we not then just decide 
whether it's a reasonable balancing of those two important interests, period. Because the material that can be collected by the press is important material that is produced... Oh, no, you're absolutely correct. It does hurt the press. And the absence of the statute hurts the interest in privacy. So my question to you is, of what relevance are all those cases? Why isn't the proper standard simply a standard that judges whether the legislature's balance of two protected constitutional interests is a reasonable one? Justice Breyer, I think that the legislature's determinations, while worthy of deference, are not always those that are best recognized under our Constitution as promoting the ultimate goals of a free and open society. But what case are you relying on that gives such strong protection to the news gathering function that it can answer the question that Chief Justice Breyer is asking? What, uh, what case says that that news gathering function trumps other important constitutional interests? Surely not Brandsburg. It didn't go anywhere near that far. In fact, it didn't come out that way. Justice Wade, Brandsburg, although not going that far, is obviously this court's clear statement about the news gathering. And, and in that case, this court said that the reporter had to talk to the grand jury. So how far do we get with that? I think we can get pretty far. The, the court has recognized in Smith v. Daily Mail that routine news gathering techniques, techniques that are uh, the sort of ordinary way that the, the news gathering press industry goes about collecting its information, should be protected. And its holdings in Florida Star v. BGF and its holdings in Cox Broadcasting v. Cohen affirm that if a news gathering organization collects material in a traditional way, even in the Cox case, in which the material was in the public domain erroneously, the state had a policy against putting the name, in that case, a rape victim in the public record and had done so. As long as the material collected is collected in a manner that's traditional, consulting the public domain, interviewing, um, in the Smith case, hearing over hearing news on the police scanner and interviewing, then this court is afforded a protection against laws to the contrary, protecting privacy in the Florida Star case, in the Cox case, laws protecting the publication of information in, in a manner intended to protect privacy. But this, but this statute is focusing on something different. This statute is focusing on what is an appropriate technique. No legislature, to my knowledge, has passed a statute saying that the press uh, is exempt from trespass laws, that the press is exempt from a whole lot of other general laws about the manner of collection. And as we move into this world where, you know, Intel chips in Windows 98 might be telling the entire world, or at least Microsoft, uh, about what we're all doing, uh, I think these concerns of how do you protect privacy and how do you actually regulate the manner of collection of information are, are going to be recurrent ones. Certainly, Justice, when privacy is a paramount value in our society. Did you, do you concede that the Chief Justice is correct in his articulation that there's a constitutional right to privacy at stake in this case? I'm not sure that the right to privacy recognized by this court's prior jurisprudence regarding privacy is necessarily implicated here. Necessarily? Well, what's your position? You mean you're not sure? We're supposed to be uncertain. You're supposed to be sure. <laughs> Petitioners would certainly concede that privacy is of, uh, of the utmost value in our society. No, no. Is it protected by the Constitution? Certainly it's protected by the Constitution. All right. In, in, this, in, the, in this circumstance, the plaintiff's privacy was constitutionally protected. Not wanting to speculate on the future of this court's jurisprudence, no, 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 no. I'm not asking about, you can't possibly predict the future of this court's jurisprudence. <laughs> My question to you is, do you see the plaintiffs as having a constitutional privacy interest that's at stake here, in this case? Perhaps in this case, yes, because the recordings occurred at home. However, another Well, then, is that the end of the case, don't you? Don't you get into this problem that you're balancing two constitutional rights now? And just as uh, the Chief Justice pointed out, doesn't that take it out of all our prior jurisprudence? And aren't you dead? <laughs> Justice Norman, hopefully I'm not dead. I just think that this court would recognize that the balancing of the interests is a balancing. It's a need to accommodate both sides of the equation. But who does that? Didn't the California legislature try to do that in this statute? If so, Justice Wood, they struck the wrong balance. They struck a balance that depends on whether or not you're in your workplace if you have privacy, even though California Supreme Court has recognized the right to privacy in the workplace. 
They, they start to ask to whether what you're doing could be conceived arguably as adverse to the public health and safety. Who's going to determine that standard? A jury in California. Any, any number of uh, offerings could be put forward by communities saying, we think that that's adverse to the public health and safety. You could imagine one community in which abortion counseling would be adverse to the health and safety, and another community in which the exact contrary would be adverse to the health and safety. And the so, press is free to collect information about all of that, as long as it doesn't use telephoto lenses. Precisely what we feel is the problem. The press is free as in any individual welcome to collect all of that information, even though the asserted goal in this case is to protect privacy. Why, when the privacy values are equally protected at home in a workplace, or at home when you're doing something illegal, and at home when you're acting lawfully, why should the, this California have a right to, or why should it even draw a content baseline distinguishing between activity that occurs that's illegal or adverse to public health and safety, and that which occurs that is personal familial, declaring one off bounds and the other. Well, all right, we could strike the health and safety clause. There's a severability provision, isn't there? There is a severability provision, just. So if, you, if, you, if that's what the problem is, I guess the answer is just strike that clause and affirm the rest of it. Chief that doesn't help you very much, I don't think, does it? <laughs> Well, Chief Justice Breyer, first, even if you severed the provision, subsection F, which refers to the uh, exemption for illegal or adverse activity, you remain, have remained the personal and familial categorization, which we find to be offensive and it still, it still says that there's an area that California thinks is important and precious, which is personal and familial activity so long as you act lawfully. And that merits privacy protection. But the rest of the, the activity that goes on is nevertheless unlawful. Did you, you think consider the severance question, counsel? I beg your pardon? Did you consider the severance question? Did we consider the question? Did you consider the severance issue, the, the fact, the proposition that Chief Justice Breyer suggested to you? In our briefs? No, before oral argument. I mean, is this a matter Certainly. of- Certainly. Yeah. Well, have you thought about what the standard should be for us as to whether those provisions can be severed? I believe that under ACLU v. Reno that this court held that you can only sever provisions if they can be severed, if they can be severed in a manner that fits with the statute and doesn't mutilate, in essence, the statute. And severing, well, what's your position? Can we or can't we? We, I, we feel that they can't. The statute... Uh, I'm sorry. You cannot. This, this statute is written in such a way that to sever simply subsection F would still leave a, set, a statute which impermissibly discriminates on the basis of content. And because of that discrimination, the only way to, to rectify the situation would either be to strike the statute entirely or, in the alternative, to read into the statute or write into the statute some generous language regarding uh, or ameliorating the problem of content-based. And because this state, this court rather, is not uh, will not be able to authoritatively interpret a state statute, such a course would be unwise. In addition to the problem of the content-based distinction that is drawn in this statute, permitting the 60 Minutes reporter to go out and do his story, but forbidding the hard copy reporter to go out and do well, no, hers. No, that's not it. You're, you, if, if, to the extent there's a content distinction at all, it's the, as I understand your argument, it's the one between personal and familial activities on the one hand and illegal <laughs> activities uh, on the other hand, just using that as a shorthand for the things that are described in F. And it's your opinion that the state of California is not permitted under the federal constitution to allow uh, the use of these uh, devices, these enhancing devices, uh, to detect illegal activity. It has to use them for everything or nothing. Uh, that, I mean, that's a very broad, I mean, these devices, I assume, could pick up anything. Um, but you, you want uh, the pillow talk, basically, to be on the TV every night. Haven't just, we just been through a year of that? <laughs> <laughs> Justice Wood, petitioners do think that these images, which are so important to our society, which have been demonstrated as important through the works of Upton Sinclair, through Nellie Bly, reporters who in their day needed only a pen and paper to convey their message, but in the modern age would need an undercover camera, would need a, a um, what, what recording do you mean microphone. Need? I think in, in this day and age, the modern media has so uh, dominated the, the sphere of communication that it is the only way to really effectively communicate your message. So I take it the, the arguments before this court are not being communicated very effectively since this court does not permit television cameras uh, to record live arguments. Certainly, Justice Wood, this court is a different matter because it's government property which regulates government information. I see that I'm out of time, so I'll conclude by saying that even if this statute does not target the press, it nevertheless is unconstitutional because it allows liability against press defendants on a showing of mere negligence and because it draws this impermissible content-based line between material that you can collect and material that you can collect. Thank, Thank you. you. 
Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the court. Good evening. My name is Grant Dixton, and together with my co-counsel, Maya Kobersi, I represent the respondents in this case, Suzanne Rogers and Michelle Rogers. Ms. Kobersi will address the second question on which this court granted certiorari and argue that the California statute is a valid content neutral law. She will also address petitioners' actual malice and overbreath arguments arguing that they both fall outside the scope of the questions on which this court granted certiorari and fail on the merits. I will address the first question at issue in this case and argue that the California statute does not unconstitutionally target the press. I'll present this argument in two parts. First, I will argue that the statute does not target the press at all. Rather, it is a law of general applicability. Second, I will argue in the alternative that should this court find that the statute does target the press, it should nonetheless uphold the statute as a permissible regulation on conduct, here, news gathering. But even if this court should find that the statute targets speech, here, dissemination, the statute should nonetheless be upheld under the strict scrutiny that the court may apply to such a statute. Now, much of the discussion in this case revolves around the question of what this court should do with a law that targets the press. This discussion, however, is not actually relevant to the outcome of this question because this statute does not target the press. And this court has long upheld the principle in cases such as Brandsburg and Cowell's Media that a statute of general applicability can constitutionally be enforced against the press. But who else uses visual or auditory enhancing devices to collect for commercial gain um, things that are sold by the time you put this entire statute together? Surely most of the time this is the press. Actually, Your Honor, there are quite a number of, of entities that could, could use the equipment in a way such as to violate the statute. For example, private investigators gathering footage and selling that footage. Your example of industrial espionage would fall under that category. Um, in fact, if an individual with a camcorder used their camcorder to gather footage and then sell it or somehow profit from it, they would also be subject to liability under the statute. But where's the commercial gain? I mean, what does liability bring about? Well, sale is listed as one of the sorts of commercial gain under the statute. And for example, a private investigator who's charged with obtaining evidence of any particular activity and who then profits from engaging in that, in that business, would, that's commercial gain, that's sale. And there would be a profit that would have to be disgorged. So now, what do you think the press can do consistently with this statute? It seems to me, under your theory, they can't even use a telephone. I mean, they didn't do that in 1791, so I guess they don't do it now. No, Your Honor. We, we certainly think that the press can use a telephone. Why? The statute, the statute regulates, according to both our and petitioner's interpretation of the statute, the use of technology that obviates the need for a trespass by enhancing sensory perceptions in such a manner as to violate individual privacy. Right. The so the reporter calls somebody's house, and the telephone rings in the bedroom, and the person answers the phone, and the reporter busily jots down notes of what he or she can hear in the background. Isn't that the use of a technological device to enhance your ability to be someplace that you could only be if you trespassed? I would say two things, Your Honor. First of all, there's no sensory enhancement in that case. It doesn't make you be able to hear better than you otherwise would necessarily. It doesn't amplify the sound. But more to the point, there's no reasonable expectation of privacy if I'm on the phone with another party and I'm talking to them and there's things going on in the background. I know that a phone picks up information. All right, but if the statute had been passed, the same statute, in the year 1880, in your view, could it have been constitutionally applied to, for example, cameras or telephones? In the year 1880? Yeah, as long same statutes passed. And it happens that given the world in 1880, people would have to trespass then to do what a camera can do or what a telephone can do. And I'm curious to know if this same statute had applied, I take it here, you believe that the state court won't apply it to telephones and ordinary cameras. But suppose in 1880 they had. Now, would it have been constitutional? I think it would have nonetheless been constitutional because it doesn't target the press. The, the claim is well, that the Well, I'm leaving that problem. out of it. I'm, okay. Let's assume that it targets the press and also Mr. Joe Smith who happens to be the only person in history who will do this other than the press. All right. <laughs> so so uh, let's assume it's basically aimed at the press. All right. On that assumption, and the assumption I just gave you, could Congress or the legislature, a hundred years ago, passing this same statute, have stopped the press from using 
cameras, and telephones. If those devices, for example, if the camera had zoom, zoom capabilities. No, no, no yes. that isn't my point. My point is, could c Congress or have passed a statute then which said people cannot use ordinary cameras. The press cannot use an ordinary camera. The press cannot use an ordinary telephone because both of those instruments permit reporters to learn things about individuals on their own property and record them, which they couldn't have done without those instruments. I understand, Your Honor. I think in that case, assuming that those were sort of the main technologies available to the press and there was really no other it's way to gather information. They're just being the statute, introduced. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the, the statute probably at that time would have been permissible because the, what we've talked about in this case and what petitioners agree with is that what's protected is the use of routine reporting techniques. So in other when words, I, it is within the power of the legislature, in your view, to freeze the press in whatever existing technology happens to be useful at the time. And therefore, while other parts of society can take advantage of new technologies, the press, in your opinion, cannot, if the legislature so chooses. I think the legislature can do that, Your Honor. They can balance the ability of the press to gather information through other means, such as ordinary techniques as answering, answering questions, with the capability of technology to be more invasive. Now, there is a difference between the 1880 case and this case, which is that with the growth of technology, the technology here is increasingly, increasingly invasive of the individual interests in privacy. So the state interest becomes all the more important. Nothing compared to what the camera was. That's true, Your Honor. Yeah. Then isn't there a problem under the First Amendment? I don't think so, Your Honor. What this court and other courts have traditionally looked at is the question whether that the media can communicate a story, can gather information without the use of the technology. The court has upheld, for example, in the, in the press access to criminal trial cases, a right to, to have access to the trials, but it said that that's a right to listen, to observe, and to later report. They have not allowed recording of those trials and said specifically that the press doesn't have to use that information to carry out their function as isn't the press. Your, isn't your answer to the Chief Justice uh, that the camera by itself doesn't create a problem, it's only when you get to the telephoto lens which provides you with an opportunity to do that which you could not otherwise do by, except by trespassing. Isn't, wasn't that your real response? Yes, that, that would be the camera with the zoom lens example. <laughs> that's interesting because if that was your real response, wasn't, 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 a, wasn't a camera uh, given the pre-existing technology uh, a device that would permit a reporter off the premises to record many things that without the camera, he would have to enter the premises to record. For example, he might need a sketch pad and have to be up close. And certainly that's true of the telephone, isn't it? The telephone, of course, as Judge Wood points out, would permit us to hear things inside the house that we certainly couldn't hear without it unless we entered the house itself. Well, in the case of the camera, to take that first, Your Honor, with the camera... I'm glad you agreed with Judge Silberman, however. <laughs> <laughs> well, in, in the case of the camera, yeah. there, there, there is you a fundamental to difference. Now? You want to evaluate now? You want to choose sides here? Or you want to... <laughs> no, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll leave the court to decide that, Your Honor. But I think in the case of a camera, the zoom lens or the telephoto lens does make a significant difference because though a camera without any zoom capabilities, and presumably the first cameras didn't have such capabilities, although I don't know for sure, uh, you could record information using that technology. You couldn't see anything. You couldn't observe every, anything that you couldn't otherwise observe. In other words, if the camera just replicates what the naked eye can see, there's no increased invasion of privacy by use of the of camera. Of course, the basic question we're getting at is, is the First Amendment to the Constitution an amendment that is consistent with a view that freezes technology? I mean, uh, isn't there some interest on the part of the press in being able to advance using new technologies, even though those technologies may be capable of interfering with people's privacy. Well, Your Honor, we're not claiming that there's no interest at all there. We, I think it is important for this court to note that it's true that technology increases and the press might want to make more use of that technology, 
But with increasing invasiveness of technology, there's also an increasing interest on the other side of the equation. The invasion of privacy becomes greater and greater. An argument is that it's reasonable for the legislature to balance the increases on one side of the equation, the press interest side of the equation, with the interest on the other side of the equation, the interest in protecting Council, privacy. I have a question that goes to the uh, content regulation. Whether this is targeted on the press or burdens the press, would you not concede if this statute was designed to propagate certain views or certain press stories and prohibit others, it would be virtually certain to be unconstitutional? If this court should find that the statute is in effect an instance of viewpoint discrimination, which is I think what you're saying, Your Honor, then well, the, the court- I didn't say viewpoint, content, content. If it says certain stories can appear and certain stories cannot, that you, you, you would concede that would be a constitutional problem for you. We would concede at that point that if, in fact, the statute was regulating actual dissemination, which we don't concede, well, but, but if we, but well, then if we the would get to. Is con if the statute is driven by a content distinction between what is, let us say, politically correct to be propagated and what is not, you would say that was unconstitutional, right? We would say you, at that point we would get to strict scrutiny, and petitioners have suggested that the interest on the other no, side of the but equation. You, well, wouldn't you? In my hypothetical, if this statute permitted the propagation of certain view, of certain content, certain stories which were thought to be politically correct and not others, you, would you not concede it was unconstitutional? I would concede at that point if it was mere political correctness, that probably wouldn't well, be catered me, to the me, interest in Let's in, take in a look at the privacy. statute there. Certainly. Uh, the provision which you refer to in your, in your brief as just permitting the pursuit of illegality. Actually, as petitioner's brief described it, and you never responded at all in your brief to this point, is much broader than that. It permits someone with an articulable suspicion, whatever that means, any individual, uh, to surveil if they believe there's a pattern of business practices adversely affecting public health or safety. What the devil does that mean? Well, Your Honor, one thing that the California legislature did in enacting that statute is reference the existing tort law and, our, and understood that that tort law would be used to sort of define but the I don't know. I want you to tell me what a pattern of business practices adversely, an articula, articulable suspicion that someone's engaged in a pattern of business practices adversely affecting public health or safety. What does that mean? Well, Your Honor, I think it actually sounds to me like it means, gee, if they're engaged in business and they're engaged in producing a product, uh, they're capitalist and they may be bad people, so we can surveil them all we want to. Is that what it means? Well, first of all, Your Honor. Is that what I, it means? I don't think so, Your Honor. You don't think so? What does it mean? Well, Your Honor, I think that when we look at the term um, pattern of business practices, it doesn't even mean a corporation. It could be a private, it could be a private individual engaged in a pattern of business practices, right? It's possible, but I would suggest that the use of the term business practices does suggest the focus on businesses. It does suggest what? A focus on businesses. And not but it doesn't mean corporations. That could be anybody who was engaged in business. Certainly that's, not. That's, that's, that certainly means a commercial transaction, right? It could be a partnership, a corporation. Any certainly. commercial transaction. That's correct. And adversely affecting public health or safety. Can you imagine uh, a range of dispute as to what constitutes uh, adversely affecting public health or safety? I think there are some range of disputes. I would but, the, but the really, the, you think there's certain things the legislature had in mind, like the food line case. That's okay. Yes, Your Honor. Right. Well, isn't that content discrimination? Your Honor, I don't think it is. And though my co-counsel will get into this, the question of why Section F is not a content-based distinction, we feel there are several reasons why, in fact, that the Section F is not content-based, dealing with focusing on the underlying activity rather than subsequent expression and deciding that certain activity doesn't deserve protections. The privacy of committing certain activities does not deserve, deserve protection. In other words, committing illegal activity is not, an act, is not something that deserves the you protection. You keep talking about illegal activity, but the statute isn't limited to illegal activity. Or That's what of sort of practices. surprised me about your brief, because in response to petitioner's argument, you treated it as only illegal activity. But the statute is much broader in its exemption, isn't it? The statute is, is broader. I don't think it's actually much broader. If, even for the pattern of but prisoners' practices or activity. But maybe this is not fair. Maybe it's your co-counsel that's going to raise this issue. Is that correct? She is, Your Honor, but oh, I would just for, note finally I'll leave that, it for her. You've okay. teed it up for her. <laughs> Certainly, Your Honor. 
I'd like to get back to the initial argument I was making, which was that the statute should be upheld as a law of general applicability. Now, on its face, Section 1708.8 is such a, such a statute. Each of its liability provisions, each of its substantive provisions, apply to any person in violation thereof, not to any reporter, any immediate entity, or so forth. In fact, the one mention of anything that has anything at all to do with the press in the statute, which occurs in subsection E, actually constricts rather than expands liability. It suggests that publication or broadcast alone cannot serve as a basis for liability. Now, petitioners do go on to point out that looking at the mere text is not enough. We also have to look at whether the statute has the actual import of targeting the press. In fact, they bring up two arguments. One is the notion that invasive recording equipment constitutes the essential tools of the press, and that because this, target, this statute targets such equipment, the use of such equipment, it targets the press, is essentially their argument. Now, first of all, the petitioners have no support whatsoever for the notion that the, these, these tools constitute the essential tools of the press. In fact, the press... What if they're just helpful, though, as we've been saying? Surely they are, in fact, things that the press use. Is your honor, they find them helpful. Your Honor, we would not contest that the press finds this technology helpful and would like to use the technology. But in going to the question of whether the statute targets the press by focusing on no, this no, technology... There's some other, few others, but I mean, there are not many others, are there? Interviews, um, Yeah, I mean, there are a few others. Would the tax in the Minnesota case have been different if they said, uh, we apply the tax to newspapers and also to uh, people who sell butcher paper? Well, Your Honor, actually... I mean, that doesn't just mean the press. I mean, there are a couple others. Does that, make a, does that make a constitutional difference, a handful of others? Actually, in Minneapolis Star, Your Honor, the court said if the tax were generally applicable, in other words, if we taxed anybody... Yes, yes, that's paper. true. But I mean, what I'm finding difficult with the argument is, of course, that we, I would think it does apply to a few other people who aren't in the press, but not many others. And, and can that make a constitutional difference, throwing in a handful of others? Well, Your Honor, first of all, I would argue that this doesn't just throw in a handful of others. It, oh. it throws in, there's a lot of others here. Mm -hmm. The entire private investigator field, for example, petitioners say Section F is a de facto exemption for private investigators, but that rests on the assumption that all private investigators do is investigate illegal activity. Now, that th this is not the case is evidenced by sort of the tortured na nature of the example they use, perjury about adultery. Now, it's true that if a private investigator is investigating perjury about adultery, they would be exempt from liability under the statute but say they were just investigating adultery by itself. I see that my time is up, and I finish my statement. If they were, in fact, investigating adultery by itself, mm -hmm. they would be subject to the liability provisions of the statute. That being the case, it goes too far to say that Section F somehow provides a de facto exemption for private investigators. Thank you very much. Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the court, my name is Maya Kobersi. I will be arguing that California's Invasion of Privacy Act is a valid, content-neutral regulation. I will also explain why petitioners' overbreadth and actual malice arguments both exceed the bounds of this court's grant of certiorari and fail on the merits. To the extent that this court determines that the California statute regulates an activity that is deserving of constitutional protection, it must then consider whether the statute does this, achieves this regulation in a constitutionally permissible way. Because petitioners do not contest that the statute regulates the place and manner in which information may be gathered, this court should next consider whether the statute is content neutral. What about my questioning? To your questions to your co-counsel on that, which I prematurely raised to him, and I should have raised to you, with respect to the division in subsection F of the statute between what is reached and what is not, and what is not reached is an activity involving a pattern of business practices, which is thought to adversely affect the public health or safety. How can that not be content uh, driven right on its face? First of all, Your Honor, the Section F exception is based not on the content of the information that's being recorded. Rather, it's based on the motive of the person doing the recording. In this case, a person who, in the scope of his employment, 
has an articulable suspicion that there is evidence of unlawful act, that there no, no, is. No, 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 you no. said in the brief unlawful, but it's much broader than unlawful. Uh, it says uh, activity involving a pattern of business practice adversely affecting the public health or safety. You can do anything you want if you have an articulable suspicion on that. You can't pursue sex, but you can pursue business. The is that it? That's what statute means, isn't it? To the extent that, that the statute would allow um, a person within the scope of his employment to investigate, for example, a restaurant who had a pattern of practice by which they left chicken unrefrigerated, causing a risk of salmonella to their consumers, then the distinction that the statute is drawing... Suppose I think that the problem with this restaurant is they put too much salt on the table. Salt's bad, so I can go in. <laughs> I can go in and use the shotgun mic to pick up the cook talking with his girlfriend because she, he may be talking to her about the salt. <laughs> Is that right? Your Honor, we do not believe that the um, dangers of salt would qualify as a pattern of business practices <laughs> adversely affecting the public health and safety. It, in fact, it is possible that the Section F, the last clause, um, pattern of business practices actually refers back to the previous requirement for fraudulent conduct involving... It's not the way it reads, Council. I, mean, I, I think you need to bring K into this as well, because it, it, K interacts with F by defining personal and familial activity uh, to be certain topics, basically, intimate details of the plaintiff's personal life, interactions with the plaintiff's family, but not those things in F. And um, it strikes me that that tells you which topics you can talk, which topics fall within the liability provisions of this statute to the extent it creates a claim for invasion of privacy and which things don't. Uh, and I'd also like you to address for a moment who is subject to these exemptions and these line drawings. In your view, uh, can uh, the petitioners uh, monitor the, the SALT conversation without fear of liability under this statute? Your Honor, it is important to note that in Section K, when the um, statute defines personal and familial activity um, and excludes criminal activity, it specifically indicates that it doesn't include illegal or otherwise criminal activity as delineated in Section F, which suggests that the Section F is intended to apply only to illegal activity, as we contended in our brief. But criminal and activity is a topic, you know, as the Son of Sam case indicates. Well, it's a topic that can be discussed. It, it's something that can be the basis of a content uh, distinction, and, and impermissibly so under that case. First of all, when the legislature enacted section or the statute itself, they were, dis they were uh, intending to protect a personal right of privacy. In enacting Section F to the statute, the legislature was cognizant of a competing compelling governmental interest, the interest in combating crime and, and, and in protecting the public health and safety, uh -huh. which justified... You're not suggesting, are you, that F is limited to crime? You're, you certainly didn't. In your brief, you sort of ignore the rest of the section, but you're not, you never say it's limited to crime. Although and I can't see how you can, because it says or activity in violation of law, or pattern of business practices adversely affecting the public health or safety. Yes, Your Honor. We, despite these, um, the wording of Section K, we would contend that the Section F exception does protect the state compelling interest in protecting the public health and safety as well. But the Section F exception is not based on the content of the information being recorded. Rather, it is based on the motive of the person doing the recording. For example, if two people both go to record the same information, one person, because he has an articulable suspicion that a restaurant is using too much salt to such a degree that the public health and safety is jeopardized, and the other person, for completely alternative reasons, perhaps just because he's interested in hearing what the two people are conversing about um, in the restaurant, the, s the first person would not be liable under the statute, whereas the second person would be, even though the content of the information recorded is exactly the same. They would now both you have record... you really worried about overbreadth, because it sounds like you're saying the reporter with a pure heart uh, is okay under this statute, but somebody with... Uh, less wonderful motives uh, will 
not only be uh, him or herself subject to liability, but will subject the employer and everybody else up the line. This court it's has a motive test. This court has recognized the permissibility of a motive-based exception in a case such as Wisconsin v. Mitchell, in which this court allowed a Wisconsin statute that increased the penalty for those criminal defendants who chose their victims on the basis of race, and even said in that case that the that past statements made by that person could be used against him to prove that he had an impermissible motive in, in making the, or in choosing the victim of his crime. But that's yeah. not a First Amendment case. In the First Amendment area, the court has stressed that we need clear rules so that we won't chill speech. Right. Although the, the Wisconsin v. Mitchell involved criminal sentencing, there, the court did suggest that the First Amendment, or there was a claim made that the First Amendment rights of Mitchell were violated to the extent that his past statements were being used against him, and the court nonetheless held that that was permissible and that the Wisconsin statute was um, constitutional. Counsel, I want to take you to the question that the Chief Justice raised of severability, uh, which is if we concluded that the language of F created a certain, certainly a content distinction on the part of the legislature's triggering strict scrutiny and presenting a constitutional problem. Um, what do you think about his suggestion of severance of, those, of the latter part of Section F? Although this court could indeed sever the Section F exception pursuant to the, the statute severability clause. Well, but we should only do that if we think the legislature would have uh, passed the legislation anyway. Isn't that part? We have to look at the legislative intent, right? Yes, you see that how is intertwined. Correct. Can you imagine the California legislature passing a law, getting it through, that would stop? Uh, the newspapers from doing food line, food line investigations. Can you imagine that in your wildest dreams? Your Honor, it is. It was one thing to go after the paparazzi. It's another thing to go after the Los Angeles Times. The statute does not go after either the paparazzi. No, but I'm, I, I grant you, I put that in a tendentious fashion. But, but uh, you see, the, what about the point there? Should we sever if we conclude there is no way this statute would have been passed? if it barred the use of these augmenting devices to stop investigation of a food line a problem? Your Honor, the inclusion of the severability clause suggests that the California legislature was willing to sacrifice various clauses within the statute to preserve its ultimate constitutionality. However, the legislative history did indicate that the California legislature was concerned with a possibility of un in a rise in undetected criminal activity and therefore extended the Section F exception to um, activity you reporting. Just, you just insist on referring A. to this public health and safety as criminal because you don't want to acknowledge that an articulable suspicion that somebody's up to something that I think might be unhealthy uh, is so vague uh, and so obviously content uh, driven as to jeopardize your position. So you keep talking about it as if it's illegality, as if the other part of the statute doesn't exist. Your Honor, I was quoting the California legislative history which referred to undetected criminal activity and not to uh, public health so and safety. So you think the California legislature would be perfectly happy to delete that provision and bring down the wrath of the press on their heads? Well, first of all, the Section F exception could apply to the press just as well as it would apply to the Los Angeles Police Department, and therefore... But the argument, the argument that's been presented to us has been, by petitioners, that there's really two kinds of press. And what, has been involved in, what is involved in this statute is an effort to ban the tabloid press and the tabloid activities, not the real substantive stuff, not the Woodward and Bernstein stuff. That's to protect it. Your Honor, we contest the uh, petitioner's claim that only certain members of the press engage in investigative, investigative activity that might fall under the Section F's motive-based exception. For example, Mademoiselle, a beauty magazine, just this month published an expose on um, plastic surgery in which they went undercover mm -hmm. into various plastic surgery um, surgeons' offices to determine whether they were comporting with the health and safety requirements that um, would apply to such and, uh, I'd like to go back just for a minute to um, a question we asked earlier. 
uh, of your colleague, but I would like to be interested in your response. Can, could could uh, the legislature, in your opinion, constitutionally pass a law that would uh, ban the use of cameras for this purpose, ordinary cameras, or ordinary, uh, ordinary recording, no enhancement? Could they do that? The use of cameras would not fall under the statute. No, no, I'm not here. talking about that. I'm saying could con Congress or the state legislature, consistent with the First Amendment, pass a statute that banned the use of ordinary cameras to record events taking place on private property? Your Honor, the use of ordinary cameras to record um, mm -hmm. activities occurring even uh, on private property would not violate an expectation of privacy. And no, I'm, I'm asking for your question. I'm asking for your response. Yes or no? In your opinion, could the legislature pass a statute that banned the use of cameras? I would say no under no, City of No, they Hindu. could not. Fine. Then my question is, and what's the difference here? The difference here, Your Honor, is that there is a competing governmental interest that justifies the regulation that was passed by the California legislature. There's also a competing governmental interest with ordinary cameras. Things that go on on private property are by and large private, and people would prefer not to have their pictures taken in respect to some of those activities. So why, since cameras can record, ordinary cameras can record private activities, very private ones, why, could the, why does the First Amendment forbid a law that bans the use of ordinary cameras, but permits a law that, banned, that bans the use of enhanced cameras? An ordinary camera would not violate an expectation of privacy because even though it can record activity that's occurring on private property. I don't property, usually think people are sneaking around my house taking pictures of me. If a person were actually. <laughs> you know a different set of people. I don't if a person were using an ordinary camera from within the person's home without their permission... No, no, they're just looking through the window. They get up on a stepladder. <laughs> then there would still be trespass laws to regulate the use of those, the, the person coming onto the private property. The, I'm, the, the, no, no, they're not on the private property. That was my question. It's a question. very small lot. No. It, we actually do have. It's quite small. It is small. Maybe they live in a basement apartment. If a person is using an ordinary camera from public property mm -hmm. to take pictures of events mm -hmm. that are occurring on private property, yes. it is unlikely that they would be able to, to capture any information that they could not have observed with the, with the naked eye. And if you look at the Fourth Amendment cases, though, in the area of surveillance, the helicopters flying over the marijuana fields and the thermal detectors, um, People tend to argue, sometimes unsuccessfully, that they have an expectation of privacy from things that can be seen with the native, na uh, naked eye. The thing to remember with the Fourth Amendment cases is that the court has held, though, that there is not a reasonable expectation of privacy in events that occur in public view. And to the extent that it is a commonplace occurrence for people to be passing by with ordinary cameras, then there would be no reasonable expectation well, of privacy. Well, 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 that's interesting. But you have been making a very important argument that it's one thing to go and look through somebody's window, and it's quite another thing to take an image and record it. And so why could the legislature not ban the use of ordinary cameras to take an image of what's going on through my window? Because you say they cannot. But they can pass one that stops the use of that telephoto lens. What's, what, why, why is the line drawn there? The line is drawn there because an ordinary camera allows the capturing of the same information that you would see with the naked eye. And in that sense, the invasion of privacy, if there even is one, is exactly the same. A camera with a telephoto lens or the use of a shotgun microphone allows the capture of information that could not be seen with the, with the naked eye. And for that reason, it's a greater invasion of privacy than would otherwise occur. And Why is that? I mean, just because people don't expect that other people are spying on them with something other than the naked eye? The reason, Your Honor, is as um, the Pennsylvania Superior Court noted in Commonwealth v. Keen, is that the invasion of privacy can then occur whenever the information is viewed again. The, plain, the person's privacy rights are violated repeatedly up, up, up when uh, the information has been recorded. But I thought you were focusing on the initial invasion being a more severe one if this telephoto lens uh, or other device 
pushed beyond what the naked eye would, would permit, that people may be going about their business thinking that they're unobserved, but uh, unfortunately for them, they are, are in fact being observed, even though they can't see anybody. Yes, Your Honor, and that is why the reasonable expectation of privacy comes into play. You, you have, if you're inside your home, you expect that your activities are private and will not be observable to anyone outside well, your home. It, uh, it's, why isn't it all just too complicated? But why don't we simply say, look, the only workable rule is to say what you observe in any way at all from the public street, that's it. You can do that. If you go into somebody's house, you can't. But if you can observe it from the public street, however, it's okay. The Constitution protects it when it's the press. I mean, that's a clear line. You're on the public street or you're not. You're in somebody's house, bad. You're on the public street, might be morally reprehensible, but what you do is your business if you're the press. That's simple, clear, prevents us from getting all these technical. Your Honor, I see that I am out of time, but I'm oh, sorry. With the oh, court's or permission. you can answer that very difficult question yes. in about 10 seconds. <laughs> The, the reason there is that within your home you yes. would have an expectation of privacy and to the extent that a law that forbade the observation of any or forbade um, the observation of anything that occurs within the home I'm not sure I understand the example anymore but um, if it's taking place from the public street there is a lesser likelihood that there is a reasonable expectation of privacy in that case thank you thank you Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the court. I'd like to spend um, the bulk of this reply responding to what I see as the court's main concern in this case, which is given that privacy is an important value, given that people have interest in privacy in their home, and given that the First Amendment's protections for the press are an important value, how can you balance this and how can you draw the line? And that's the case that the, the conflict between these two ideas has been recognized by this court many times in Gertz and Hill, this inevitable conflict when you put privacy against the press. Mr. Devlin Brown, can I just mix this up a little bit as you um, do this? It seems to me one way of looking at what the California legislature has done uh, in a way has been to take trespass law as its baseline and say that was understandable at a time when people really were left to their own human devices about when they were going to intrude in somebody's property or their home. Uh, but as technology has, has advanced, we need to correct it on the trespass side of the equation in a way. And we've mentioned telephoto lenses, but there are many other things, thermal imaging devices and the like, uh, that can actually get uh, quite intrusive indeed. And without some sort of legislation to adjust that, you actually have a ratchet effect or you know, the incredible shrinking home, which would leave us eventually nothing. Why can't the legislature do that? Justice Wood, um, we think they can. We think an unacceptable alternative for this court would be to say that California has to draw the line at trespass. An equally unacceptable alternative would be for the court to um, balance each case on its own and decide where privacy and the First Amendment clash. Well, at physical trespass in a way. I mean, what we're talking about is some sort of a proxy. A proxy for trespass right. in a sense. Just as we do in the, in the field of intellectual property rights. The legislature has defined a concept in a way that now you can't go beyond. We think the common law tort of intrusion in California does sort of bring trespass uh, into the modern world and deals with that in this way. And we would not ask the court to uh, strike that down as our primary arguments. Instead, we suggest prophylactic rules, common prophylactic rules in this court's jurisprudence that the legislature can make the balance between press and privacy as long as it doesn't target the press, which raises suspicions that sense suppression of expression is the motive, or draw content-based lines. And if, if you're willing to give away the common law uh, tort here, and you're willing to concede in a way that that's fine, and uh, you've already agreed that this statute doesn't, in fact, on its face, single out the press, even though they may be frequently uh, involved, I'm not sure where the Constitution steps in to tell the California legislature it can't clarify for these brand new technologies what it means by this common law tort. 
I think the Constitution uh, does step in when um, either the press is singled out or the content on which the press is recorded on comes into play. And the, the case I would cite which on of, content. Which of these two arguments do you think is the strongest? Um, Justice Silberman is probably a combination of the two in this case. Ah, and, which is what the court held essentially in Arkansas Writers Project v. Raglan, that it was the combination of focusing on particular members of the press and on the content of which they report. In Kerry v. Brown, um, if I. If you had no content distinction here at all, if what was banned was this technique by anybody, uh, your case would be considerably weaker, wouldn't it? Our case would be considerably weaker. So, so your key factor then is the content discrimination or content drive, is Our, the, the content drive is a key factor, yes. So then why doesn't Justice Breyer's severance suggestion save the statute? Because I think the severance um, decision, uh, which was again articulated in uh, Reno v. ACLU is you should only do this if it's going to leave in place a law that the legislature wanted. And there's no evidence from the legislative history or anywhere that the legislature would have passed this statute if they had to include all forms of content. There's Except also the severance clause itself. I mean, they did put it in there. This court has previously noted that although the inclusion of a severance clause is relevant, it's not the only factor in deciding what you should do in terms of severing. These, these clauses are in all the time, and while certainly that doesn't mean we should totally ignore them and disrespect them, uh, I don't know why I'm saying we, why you should totally ignore them <laughs> and disrespect them. In this case, the legislative history indicates clearly that, that California wanted to punish a certain kind of journalism and it wanted to punish the paparazzi. And it found that the only way it could do that and get the bill passed was to essentially exclude private investigators and essentially exclude a broad range of conduct. So I think it's very unclear if they would have intruded on privacy in this manner. It's very unclear in the words of Justice Scalia in Florida Star whether they would have passed a or I'm not going to be able to make this into a quote, but here they've placed a burden on the press that they've seemed to be unwilling to impose on the society. For that reason, this law should be struck down. Thank you.
Right. This is my order. Good Can we get some view too? No, no, no. Come on. Laugh. Laugh. How about the no, better How about the three of you? Right. Make it quick. Look at it. Look at it. Well, we very much enjoy the opportunity to hear this argument. As you can tell from the length of time, and as I know the audience realizes, this was really close. I mean, uh, we sat there for quite a while dumbfounded as to how would we decide this, and we considered just not deciding it, and then we realized, well, we are judges. It would be terribly embarrassing uh, not to be able to, and, 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 and so this is a very, very difficult. Any one of these could have been the exact opposite. It's. Uh, uh, close to a flip of the coin, which is what Judge Silverman thinks is the way we normally decide our cases. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, uh, um, uh, in any case, the best we have three categories: the best oralist, which we uh, have awarded to Mr. Devlin Brown. Best brief we have given to the respondents. I think that deserves a consideration. And overall, we have awarded the victory to the petitioners. But before, but before, before you become overly enthusiastic about the winners of this, I'd like you to realize that it could as easily have gone the other way. And I think we should stand up and applaud all four at these contestants and their supporters. I've sat on moot courts now for 14 years, and every single time it's agreed beforehand the presiding judge would lie and tell everybody how close it was. <laughs> this is the first time in, that I can recall it was really true. We had one hell of a time trying to decide the winner. Well, I certainly uh, agree with, with everything that my colleagues have said, and I want simply to add the fact that um, our compliments go as well to the people who created this problem. Uh, we had no difficulty whatsoever, bearing in mind the fact that, as 
Sometimes one side has an argument that's just easier to put together in a coherent way and the other one doesn't. Not at all true this time. Very serious and interesting points to be made on both sides and so uh, our compliments certainly to the people who made that possible and who worked so hard on this record and on this problem and came up with something that uh, I think in fact will be an issue that we'll be living with. Whether the Supreme Court sorts it out properly or not uh, is another question. <laughs> Sometimes on our court, uh, we, we regard with horror the idea of putting something in bank because we're afraid that maybe we'll wind up with eight different opinions, which we've done in the past. Uh, but, but this is a difficult case indeed. And the, the excellence of these arguments was just a pleasure to see. And I thank you very much for including me. Right, so we'll thank you all. It was a difficult case very well put together in the record, very close, very well argued, both in the briefing and orally. So I'd say on behalf of our panel, thank you all very much.